Second Samuel, uh, chapter number seven. Uh, I don't know how far I get. You, I promise you, I won't be long. Uh, but boy, I, 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 man, I'm excited uh, about what the Lord's given us. Second Samuel seven. For the sake of time, uh, look with me at verse number eighteen. Second Samuel chapter seven and verse number eighteen. We find in the first part of the chapter, uh, David was talking to Nathan. And then God talks to Nathan, and then Nathan talks to David. And now God, or David, is about to talk to God. I like the very first few words of verse number 18. It says, Then went King David in. Where'd he go? Where'd he go? A lot of places, plot somewhere where we often probably need to find ourselves. Before the throne of God. And sat before the Lord. In other words, he wasn't in a hurry. Uh, boy, we could preach right there for two or three hours on just going in being with God. Uh, boy, we need some more of that. Look what David said. It's amazing when he got in God's presence, he found who he was. He said, he said Who am I, O Lord God? And what is my house that thou hast brought me hither to? When God in the presence of God, talking before God, he starts looking around at everything God's done for him. And I'm interested this morning in verse number 18, the first little part there, on then went King David in. I want to preach this simple thought is getting before God. Getting before God. One man said, true prayer is neither a mere mental exercise or a vocal performance. It is far deeper than that. It is a spiritual transaction with the creator of heaven and of earth. Mr. Spurgeon was very right when he wrote that. Ian e. Bound said this, Prayer outlives the lives of those who's uttered them. They outlive a generation. They outlive an age. They outlive a world. Ravenhill said, Quit playing and start praying. Quit feasting and start fasting. Talk less with men, talk more with God. Listen less, less to men, listen to the words of God. Skip travel and start travail. If we want to see God move, it's going to take us moving. We find where David went in. And may I say we find in verse number 1 of chapter number 7, we find where David got rest from the enemy. Look there in verse number 1. And it came to pass when the king sat in his house, and the Lord had given him rest around about from all his enemies. David has been battling for the people of God. David has been fighting wars that probably should have never been fought, hadn't it been for another generation before he had taken care of business. David is now at a spot in his life where God brings it out that he got rest around about from all of his enemies. May I say this about battles in life? Battles will work on your mind. Sure. Amen. Amen. Physical, mental, financial, emotional battles, family battles, work battles. Boy, those things will work on your mind. I wish a lot of times in life, Pastor, I wish that I could just go to a place where I could cut my mind off. I wish, uh, Brother Aaron, I could go to a place, Brother Jordan, when I'm laying in bed, everybody's asleep. I wish sometimes, Brother Donald, I could sit up there and just cut my mind off from having to work and think about everything going on, the battles of life. One thing I've learned about life, battles will work on your mind. They will destroy your mind. The devil's playground is the mind. Battles, those long battles that we face will work on your mind. Not only will they work on your mind, they will weaken your ministry. Battles will cause you to lose hope and to lose faith in God. Boy, I've traveled this year a lot. I give God all the glory for it. But you know what I'm seeing in these days, preacher? Not everybody's smiling no more. There used to be me and Miss Taylor. We'll leave church somewhere and she'll say, I wonder what, where they are. Brother Phil, where's those people at? Why, what's wrong with them? Man, why, why aren't they happy no more? You know why? Battles that we face 
will weaken you. Battles will cause you to lose joy. Battles will cause you to, man, turn that smile upside down. Those life, life's pressure, life's battles, physical battles, mental battles, financial battles in these days, well, they will cause you to lose your joy. I remind you, ladies and gentlemen, our joy shouldn't be in things. Our joy shouldn't be in material things. Our joy shouldn't be in a big house and a big job, but it should be in a very big God. When all things burn and go to hell, you can still have joy unspeakable and full of glory in your heart. My joy isn't in my things because I don't have much. Amen. Boy, my things, my hope, my joy is in God. The devil's job is to work on our mind, to weaken the ministry. Then I've seen this, battles will wreck the multitude. You know what I'm seeing in these days? Uh, the battle that we face today, the devil knows his time is about out. My dad's always said this, church is nothing but many families coming together. The, the devil don't care about the sheetrock in the beautiful building you have. What the devil does care about is each individual pew that your family's sitting on this morning. That's where the battle is fought. I can't tell you how many people we've come in contact this year. Man, you talk to them. You know, where's your family at? Well, we, we split up. We did this. You know where the devil's working and winning at? He's working and winning in the homes. That's the fight, Dad. When the devil tries to get you to look at things you know you shouldn't look at, that's a battle you probably should never fight. Amen. Amen right there. Boy, the devil will put something out in you, and boy, it just takes one little thing, the boy, to catch your attention and move on. Boy, the enemy will wreck the multitude. One guy said this, if you don't come apart, you will come apart. May I say, ladies and gentlemen, that God is very interested in the word resting. You say, preacher, I just got to go, 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 go. Go ahead and you'll burn out. Can I say this right here? It's okay to take a break. Can I get amen right there? Well, one lady, out, one lady said this to Brother Vance Havener. He was preaching a sermon on the stewardship responsibility of getting proper rest. Dr. Vance Havener said that it was right for Christians, I like this preacher, amen, to plan time for rest and vacation. I say amen right there. And, do not, and to do not so was unwise. A lady came up and piously objected. She said, well, you know, the devil never sleeps. The devil never takes a vacation. Dr. Havener responded, since when am I supposed to be like the devil? You know what I've learned about life? It's okay to take a break. Sure. Amen. I promise you, just being made this coming February, be already three years, I can't believe it. You know what I've come to find in our marriage? Boy, if you just go, 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 it causes a strain on the home. Sure. You just go, go, work, 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 come home, work, 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 go home. Boy, it causes a strain in the home. It's okay every once in a while to go out and eat by yourself. Say amen. We need to do more of that. Just kind of go relax your mind because the devil knows, boy, if he can get a marriage, boy, he can get a mom and dad mad at each other, a husband and wife mad at each other and come in here, boy, to cause chaos in the house of God. David is now at rest. He is taking a break from the enemy. Be honest with you, there's a lot of times in life where it's good to get a little break from the enemy. It's not all the time. It normally don't last long, but every once in a while, it's good to boy the devil not fighting you. It the devil's not causing chaos at the house. Boy, I take full advantage of that because the times are very true where the devil will come and he will wreak havoc in our home and he will wreak havoc in our mind. And but every once in a while, Brother Donald, that rest comes. God gives the enemy, boy, he lets them be at rest. And, boy, you know what you do? You just sit and soak it up because you can think clearly. Boy, you can just relax. The devil's not at work. That David is now at rest. You say, preacher, God don't care about rest. Thank you for saying that. Genesis 2, verse number 2. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day. 
from all of his work which he had made. Psalm 16, verse number 9. Therefore my heart is glad, and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope. Psalms 37, verse number 37. Rest in the Lord, and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself, because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Hebrews 4, verse number 10. For he that has entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own words, as God did from his. I want to say this. Don't get so busy trying to do everything in life. Get you some spiritual, some physical rest. Amen. You say, preach, I just got to go, go, go. You will burn out faster than anything. David got rest from his enemy. There he is the right emotions. Look at verse number two and verse number three. That the king said unto Nathan, the prophet, see now I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwelleth within curtains. And Nathan said to the king, go do all that is in thy heart, for the Lord is with thee. It's amazing to me, he did not make a decision when he was busy. He was resting. And God gave him clear thinking. I want to say this right here, that a lot of times we make decisions when we're busy and they end up being bad decisions. This, This is simple this morning. This is not some big thing, but this is what God showed me. Well, he got clear thinking when he got rest from God. Never make a decision when your mind is completely occupied with everything else. What a great thing to build a house for God. Soon as he got rest, he had the right thoughts. Proverbs 16, verse number 3, Commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. Philippians 4, verse number 8, you know this verse, Finally, my brethren, Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, turn off the news, say amen right there. If there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. A lot of kids, a lot of young couples, a lot of moms and dads mess their lives up by making a a, a fast decision when your brain's completely fried full of everything else. And I say David now has a clear thought. David now is now making the right decisions. We find in verse number 4, through verse number 8, 17, we find a report that was encouraging. Look at verse number 4. It came to pass that night. That the word of the Lord came unto Nathan saying, can I say this? Nathan was the prophet in those days. I will say this and it still goes back here in the Old Testament. God always has a man with a message. Amen. You know I believe in church because God uses his man to get the message across. You say, well preacher, God can speak to me. He can. But God chose through the foolishness of the preaching to confound the wise. That's why we come to church, because we need to get a word from God. Look at verse number 5. We find it was a forthright report. Look at verse number 5. Go and tell my servant David. It was no mistake who these words were going to. One thing I've learned about God, God is very clear in what he says, when he says it, and to whom he says it. Yeah, man, a lot of people, well, preacher, I, I preached the other day. And man, it's, they, they, they meant well. I know what they meant. Preacher, they come up to me and said, boy, if, if you, they would have been here, you would have got all over them. And I just kindly remarked, I went preaching to the ones that wasn't here. Right. Boy, they, they, I guess they had some trouble in the church or something. She said, boy, if you would have got them, if they would have been here, you would have got them. And that's just like God. God never misses. Right. God never strikes out. Right. God don't make accidents when the man of God boy gets in his study, gets the word of God. You say, well, well, pastor, they, if they would have been here, you would have got them. Your pastor's not preaching to the people that's not here. God is very specific and very forthwith for who he's aiming at. There is a forthright report. There is a former report. I like verse number six. Whereas I have not dwelled in any house since the time 
that I brought up the children of Israel out of Edom. This is God talking to Nathan. Even to this day, but have walked in a tent and in a tabernacle. How about that? Boy, could you imagine back there in the Old Testament? Boy, he said he was walking in a tent and a tabernacle. Everybody's asleep and the Holy Ghost just sitting there walking around. Amen. And all the places wherein I have walked, with all the children of Israel spake I a word with any other tribes of Israel whom I commanded to feed my people Israel, saying, Why build ye not me in a house of cedar? By like verse number 8, here he is, it goes again. He uses that word, my servant David. Now therefore so shalt thou say unto my servant David, Thus saith the Lord of hosts. Oh boy, I like this. I took thee from the sheep coat, from following the sheep, to be ruler over my people, over Israel. And I was with thee whithersoever thou wentest, and have cut off all thine enemies out of thy side, and have made thee a great name, like unto the name of great men that are in the earth. May I say it was a report of God reminding him of his start. Yeah. See there in verse number 8, David is now sitting upon a throne. Maybe David has got the big head. Maybe David has come a spot in his life where he is filled as he has arrived. David has come and he's made it into society. Boy, he's, he's the big cheese. He's, man, he's the man. Isn't it just like God to humble us down? He told Nathan to tell David, David, I want you to remember where you come from. 1 Samuel 16, verse number 11. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Are here all thy children? And he said, There remaineth yet the youngest. And behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, See him and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come hither. I remind you, David, that way before you become king of Israel, you used to be a little nobody on the backside of nowhere. Before I come to you and boy, done big things in your life, brother Christian, little David was just a little sheep boy. He didn't have much accolades in life. Why well, feel a preach right here, amen. Little David out there, just nobody knows David. Only God. David out there just fighting the lions and the bears. Nobody around to give him the applause. Nobody around to give him the attaboys. He was just out there being a little old shepherd to nobody. He said, David, don't forget from where you come from. Boy, the Holy Ghost climbed in my lap yesterday in the motel. And boy, he took me down a memory lane where he found me. Boy, I wasn't always saved. Can I get an amen right there? Boy, I didn't always have the touch of God in my life. Boy, there's times boy, I was wicked as hell. Eh? Boy, I was wicked and wrought in this world. Uh, boy, the Holy Ghost come by and changed my life. Uh, I'm here where I am today, not because of who I am, not because of the blood uh, that runs in my veins, but I am here today because God did a work in my heart. Uh, I don't want to ever forget where God brought me from. Uh, I don't want to forget what I used to be. Uh, I don't want to forget the sorry mess I was in but oh my God God come and done a work and God changed my life and God snatched me out of hell I don't want to forget how I started this thing look what God has done that's what he's telling David boy don't forget where you come from I wonder today how many sinners we would have had, how many drunks we would have had last night, how many people popping stuff and snorting stuff uh, and shooting this stuff and drinking stuff. Uh, hadn't it been for a God coming by where we was and saved us by his marvelous grace? He said, don't forget your start. I remind you, don't feel as if you've arrived because you have it. He humbled David. He reminded him of a star. He reminded him in verse number nine of his success. Look at verse number nine. And I was with thee. Boy, I like this right here. Whithersoever thou wentest, and I've cut off all thine enemies out of thy side, and have made thee a great name, like unto the name of the great men that are in the earth. You'll find, I don't have time to read it, but in 2 Samuel chapter number 8, you'll find all the victories that David won. You, you find where David come through and cut the head off of that big old giant. 
Boy, he brought that boy. They said Saul has slain his thousands, but David has slain his ten thousands. Well, what a God David served. What a God that, boy, how many of us tonight, uh, this morning, boy, have faced battles after battle after battle. And it seems like we was about to go under. That financial battle, that physical battle, that emotional battle, the battle, that marital battle, boy, we thought we was going under. Then the good hand of God stepped on the seed and God won the victory. I like it. David gets no credit for winning the battles. David gets no credit. He said, every place you walked, I was right there with you. Every time you drew a sword, he said, I was right there with you. He said, I have made you great. David didn't make himself great. God made him great. He was giving him some humble pie. There was a forthright report. There was a former report. And I'm done right here. I want you to notice verse number 12 through verse number 14. We find the feedback report. We find the feedback, verse number 12. And when thy days be fulfilled, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers. I will, notice this now, set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels and I will establish his kingdom he shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever I will verse number 14 be his father and he shall be my son if he commit iniquity I will chasten him with the rod of men with the stripes of the children of men we find that what God gave his promise to David. But I want to say this right here. You'll find in verse number two what David wanted to build a house for God. What is what the Holy Ghost showed me so real? Taylor thought we was in there preaching to the wall. Hey Amen. I was about to let her and Carter have it yesterday. Well, the Holy Ghost showed me this. I want to help you right here. I want to help you with this. Verse number two, David wanted to do something for God. But in verse number 12 and 13, God said no. Let me ask you a question. How are you going to handle getting a no from God? Amen. You say, preacher, well, he wanted to build a house of God. What a great thing. But it wasn't his time. A lot of people, boy, they'll pray about things and God give them a no and they give up saying I'm not doing nothing else for you Lord Hello. nope you'll find there in verse number 13 he shall build a house for my name God gave him the answer he wasn't looking for how are you going to respond when God don't give you the answer amen God's saying something right there when you've been praying something for a long time it's not a bad thing, it's a great thing. You want to do something for God, but God, let somebody else do it instead of you. It's amazing to me, David not one time got mad at God for saying no. Why quit? I mean, times you heard that. And then you, what you, man, you'll pray for something, I don't know. Maybe you're praying for something in the church and God will let somebody else do it. But you, you've been praying about it. It's not a bad thing, a great thing. But God let somebody else do it. How are you going to handle that? Somebody else was supposed to, somebody else got to teach the Sunday school class instead of you. It's not a bad thing, it's a great thing to serve God. Can I say this? How do we respond when God tells us no? Oh my. May I say this? You'll find in verse number 12, the two times the word, I will. Look there, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers. I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall prosper, proceed out of thy bowels. I will establish his kingdom. Verse number 13, you'll find the two words, I will. I will establish the throne. Verse number 14, you'll find that two times. I will be his father. And he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will. Brother Christian, I was reading this yesterday and the Holy Ghost brought back to my heart. I try to remember I wills. And I, I got to thinking, man, there was a man in the Bible that got a handful of those. Yeah, 
I started turning to Genesis and I found Brother Abraham. Yeah. Amen. Listen to this. This blew my mind. Genesis 12, verse number 1 and 3. Now the Lord said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation. And I will bless thee. And I that make thy name great. Boy, don't that sound familiar? Amen. And thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee. And curse them that curses thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. I started doing a little digging. I said, man, maybe Abraham and David's connected somewhere. Turn over there to the book of Matthew chapter number one. You'll find David's dad. And I mispronounced some of these. Don't, don't hold it against me. Amen. David's dad was Jesse. Jesse's dad was Obed. Obed's dad was Boaz. Boaz's dad was Salmon. Salmon's dad was Nasson. Nasson's dad was Aminadab. Aminadab's dad was Aram. You see where I'm going with this? Aram's dad was Eshram. Eshram's dad was Pharaoh's. Pharaoh's dad was Judas. Judas' dad was Jacob. Somebody help me. Jacob's dad was Isaac. Isaac's dad was Abraham. Thirteen generations later, the very same promise God gave to great, 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 great grandpa is the very same promise small David God. Can I just time out and say this? This bless my heart. Well, I'm glad what God's promised back then. He's still the same God to promise it today. Hallelujah. What God promised back to Paul Paul, he can promise to me today. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. God can promise. His promises don't break through generations. Thirteen generations later, the very same promises that come to Abraham is still being fulfilled. Thirteen generations later in the life of David. What a God we serve. What a God we serve. God's promises are true from generation to generation. I thought you was going to preach my message this morning. Psalms 100 verse number 5. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. And the truth endureth to all generations. Say, preacher, what's that mean? I got a little boy. And that little blood test said, we got a little girl coming in May. God, help us all. Amen. Christian, you can give me some pointers. Amen. You know what that means? If they grow up and have kids, God's promise is going to be true for them. Yeah. Their kids grow up to have kids. Amen. Yeah. God's promise is going to be true then. Yeah. No matter what generation may come, God's promises are yea. God's promises don't fail. God's promises don't fall flat. God's promises go from generation to generation. That's the God we serve. My, my, that blew my mind. Luke 150 and, them, and his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. I'm done right here. How did David respond when he got a no? You'll find in verse number two, David promised to build God a house. Like what verse number 11 says, or verse number 11 says, but God promised David he would build him a house. God, David said, I want God, I want to build you a house. In verse number 11, God tells them the latter end, the Lord telleth thee that he will make thee in house. Yeah. Very same thing he wanted to give God, God gave him. Right. What a God. Don't, look, don't you turn your Bibles, I'm done. Turn to 1 Chronicles 22. What did David do? Did he get mad? No. Did he quit serving God? No. 1 Chronicles 22, verse number 3. The Bible says, And David prepared iron in abundance for the nails for the doors of the gates and for the joinings and brass in abundance without weight. Also cedar trees in abundance for the Zidonians and they of Tyre brought much cedar wood to David. You see what David's doing? He's not going to be able to build the house of God. I want to help you here. But he's going to help that next generation be ready. Amen. To be ready when God says build. All these things David does. Verse number 7. And David said to Solomon, my son, 
As for me, it was in my mind. That's what he's talking about in 2 Samuel 7. To build a house unto the name of the Lord my God. Right. Boy, he talks about how God told him and says no. Look at verse number 14. Now behold, in my trouble have I prepared for the house of the Lord a hundred talents of gold and a thousand thousands talents of silver and a brass and of iron without weight. In other words, he said there's so much here you can't even balance it on a scale. Timber also and stone have I prepared that thou mayest add thereto. Verse 16, of the gold, the silver, and the brass, and the iron, there is no number. Rise therefore and be doing, and the Lord be with thee. Well, Doug, it's, it, my preaching has changed since that little rascal has come into this world. Now, before I preach something, before I say something, and I had to learn this the hard way, say amen, men. A lot of times we just need to keep our mouth closed. Can I get amen right there, men? Don't, come on now, don't be scared to say amen. Your wife's sitting beside you. I had to learn that the hard way. After a couple of jaw smacks, amen, I learned to be quiet, amen. Her fist hurts, amen. I'm just kidding, she's sweet, amen. I will say this. What will you do when God says, no? My preaching has changed for that little rascal over there because now, preacher, there's another generation involved that God has given us. There's another generation that I have to be involved in. And there may be some things, preacher, that that little boy, God may tell me, no, Jeffrey, you can't do that. But your boy might get to do it. Think about Moses leading the people of Israel. He couldn't even go to the promised land. But you know what he did? Hear me now, and I'm almost done, amen. He invested in the next generation. I hate hearing this statement. They're kids, they're, they're teenagers. They're the church of tomorrow. Take them out of this sanctuary right now and look who you're left with. I get sick and tired of hearing that. They're the church of tomorrow. We'll invest in them later on. I'll say this, if you don't invest in them now, don't expect when they become adults, get married to want to be in church then. Right. It's amazing to me. Boy, I, boy, the Holy Ghost gave me this, and I'm done. Look at verse number three. And David prepared iron in abundance for what the big picture everybody's going to see? For the big old, man, the big old door that's going to be in front. David made the door. No. Look what David did for the nails. Boy, the Holy Ghost gave me this yesterday, and I about ran a, boy, ran a lap down that hallway. Brother Bob, here's what the Lord told me. What is the temple called? Who's this? It's Solomon's temple. David's name, boy, the Holy Ghost showed me this. David's name wasn't on it, but his hands were all over it. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah, man. Oh, my. Preacher, that hit me like a ton of bricks yesterday. Yeah. David's name, it wasn't called David's temple, no. it was called Solomon's temple. David didn't get mad at God and just quit work. You know what he did? He said, if I even have to make the nails to go in the door so my boy, good night, so my boy can go in there and worship God and my grandkids can go in there and worship God, I'll put the nail in the door. David's name wasn't on it, but his hands were all over it. Boy, you know what? When my little boy grows older, boy, I may not get to have my name on his life. They may not never say, boy, that's Jeffrey's kid. But boy, what's that thing I want to do? I want to invest my hands in his life. I want him to see daddy everywhere he walks. I want him to see daddy serving God everywhere he goes. It's not about having our name on it. It's about having our hands all over it. I want to ask you this. Boy, the Holy Ghost challenged my heart. Kids, could you find your mom and dad hands all over your life? Well, preacher, they're here for my schoolwork. I'm talking about all over. Everywhere you look, you should see mom and daddy. Right. Every time they open the door of the Solomon's Temple, well, David, it was just a little nail, but it held the door on. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. 
Amen. It didn't make much of a difference to nobody. You take the hinges off that door, that door will fall apart. And every time Solomon could walk into that temple, he said, Daddy, put that there. I'll say this, Mom and Dad. Your hands need to be all over your kids. In the spiritual aspect, they need to be all over them. In the physical aspect, I'm not talking about beating. Somebody help me. I'm talking about everywhere they look. They should be reminded of mom and dad. There's things I do. My wife reminds me, that sounds just like your father. You know why? Because his hands were all over my life. Amen. He didn't have me a lot of things growing up. We didn't have the nicest of nicest. But you know, when I look back now, hallelujah, I see his hands everywhere, all over my life. Uh, I get up to preach. I see dad's hands everywhere. It may not be his name, but he left his hands all over it. I want to challenge you moms and dads and grandpas and grandmas. Put your hands all over them. If you don't, somebody else will. That little boy, boy, I want him to see every time he does whatever he does, Christian. I want that little boy to say, that's the way daddy did it. Oh my. Boy, daddy done it like this. He sits down at the table. I want him to say, boy, daddy had it just like this. Boy, I see my dad right now, hands all over my ministry. You know why? Because it was worth investing. I'll say this, ladies and gentlemen, I'm done. Preacher, you come. If you don't invest in them now, when they get older, it'll be too late. Do you struggle to find good Bible-based resources to supplement your personal devotions? If so, head on over to ibcflorence.com today and click on Bookstore, where we have a ton of resources. And as always, thanks for listening.